I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the author um, introduced in the context of whom we invited Diana Gabaldon. Walter Scott uh, was a popular author of the 19th century. He uh, was a lawyer and a writer. Diana Gabaldon also has a first and second lives as a scientist and an author. Uh, he wrote about Scottish landscape, character, and history in a way that resonated over generations, such that Diana Gabaldon, um, long distance from, from Scotland, writes very much in that heritage. And he was an immensely popular author. And we all know that popular authors become classic authors over time, and Diana Gabaldon is already moving between shelves and the Barnes and Noble in interesting ways. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Um, we would like to thank uh, all the people who have helped us set this event up. The libraries in particular, the wonderful Maggie Farrell, Isaac Calkins, who are going to meet Roseanne Latimer. The Albany County Public Library, we love to work in partnership um, with our libraries on campus and off. To Maggie Murdoch and Nick Murdoch, uh, Maggie's the Dean of Libraries and Murdoch Murdoch Law Firm, who have also sponsored this event, we are tremendously grateful. And as I said, it's all about relationships. Um, and in uh, Diana's books and in our work as scholars, we're thrilled to see writers, critics, and readers all sitting together in front of us. You will have an opportunity to ask questions. And um, we're waiting for Diana, I guess. <laughs> some shorter than, uh, than she is. So uh, can you hear me to start with? Uh, if you can't, you know, start waving. Great, uh, well, thanks so much. It's awfully nice to see so many of you here tonight, especially when it's a beautiful summer evening and you could all be outside washing your cars or <laughs> doing other things. <laughs> you know, back in the day when I first used to go out at night to talk to people about books and all that, I'd come home and I'd tell my husband, oh, we had a great crowd, we had 15 people. <laughs> but you know, it was great, but, <laughs> but you guys are that much greater and awfully nice to see you. Even then, he'd say to me, well, doesn't it make you nervous having to go out and talk to all these totally strange people about your books? I think he meant total strangers, but, <laughs> 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 but as I said to him, I've been a university professor for 12 years. You know, if I can keep people awake at 8 o'clock in the morning talking about human anatomy and physiology, I can probably keep them awake at 8 o'clock in the evening if they came on purpose to hear me. <laughs> <laughs> Back when I did teach early in the morning, though, I taught, uh, as I say, human anatomy and physiology, which is a very popular science elective. Everybody took it, including the football team, because they thought it would be easy. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, they thought you could count your ribs on exams. But uh, I would come in in the morning, and the football players would always be in the front row, sound asleep, these large inanimate blobs of flesh. <laughs> and, uh, I'd walk up to the edge of the podium and say, well, this morning, gentlemen, we're going to discuss the history of contraception. And they'd all start blinking. <laughs> I'd say, in days of old, when knights were bold and condoms not invented, <laughs> they wrapped old socks around their cocks and babies were prevented. <laughs> <laughs> mm, well, it worked on the football players, too. <laughs> I attended the plenary lecture last night by Jenny Calder, which was a, a very charming and erudite uh, analysis of Sir Walter Scott and the, uh, the themes in his work that resonate with the uh, exploration of the American West and questions of national identity and so forth. Uh, tonight's probably going to be a little different. <laughs> uh, I was going to start by saying I'm not an academic, but that's not really right. I, uh, I am an academic, or I have been, 
uh, which is to say I've got a handful of degrees of various kinds. However, they're all in the sciences. I've got a bachelor's degree in zoology, a, a master's in marine biology, and a PhD in quantitative behavioral ecology, which is just animal behavior with a lot of statistics. Don't worry about it. But <laughs> <laughs> my PhD dissertation was entitled Nest Site Selection in the Pinion Jay, Gymnorhinus cyanocephalus. <laughs> or as my husband said, why birds build nests where they do and who cares anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I um, am an academic, or I have been an academic, but uh, not in the fields of literature, literary analysis, or uh, scholarly criticism. Uh, consequently, you know, I'm much less well equipped than all of the people attending the Sir Walter Scott Symposium to actually tell you things about Sir Walter or his work. I can, however, offer one very unique uh, um, facility that, and one you know, aspect of his, uh, his work and character that perhaps most of them can't, which is um, I'm a working novelist, as he was. I'm also a historical novelist, and more specifically, I write Scottish fiction. <laughs> so I can maybe give you a little bit of an insight on how that works, which might uh, tell you a little bit about Sir Walter and how he worked as well. Okay, now it's probably heresy to suggest in a place that has such a world famous MFA program that in fact uh, the majority of successful novelists, and I admit that there are a lot of different varieties of definition of success, uh, don't actually come from an academic background. And in fact most of them don't have any spe specific formal training in how to write novels. In fact, I don't think I know one best-selling novelist who's come out of an MFA program, which is not to suggest that such programs are useless, just that they don't necessarily have that much to do with writing. <laughs> That's the academics laughing, you understand? <laughs> now, Sir Walter Scott, for those of you who are not here for the symposium, was originally a lawyer uh, by training. Uh, this was kind of a common thing for uh, gentlemen lay Scots of his class to do. There was no high school or anything of that sort. So he went to the University of Edinburgh, and at the age of 18, he was a fully-fledged lawyer. Well, he uh, continued to, uh, to lawyer, and, uh, but was very interested in the tales of the, uh, of the highlands and the borders. He lived in the borders. He was a, uh, a lowlander, as they say. And that's important uh, in, when you come to t talk about Scottish fiction, because as far as cultural background um, and idiosyncrasies, the borders are as far from the highlands of Scotland as, well, not, maybe not quite as far as England is, but, uh, but there are distinct things. You know, highlanders are different than lowlanders. But he uh, knew, Lowland, uh, knew Highlanders and collected a lot of the stories that he heard, and that impelled him to begin his own literary career around the age of 25, which is when he first started writing poetry. Well, he got very successful at poetry writing, and then eventually uh, turned to novels, which he wrote anonymously for several years so as not to ruin his reputation as a poet. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. As I say, most uh, writers don't come from a, a formal writing background as such. They all did something else first, or most of the ones I know. So Sir Walter was a lawyer. Um, Ian Rankin, who's a, a friend of mine and another very well-known Scottish novelist, uh, tells me that he was at one point in his career a tax collector and at another point a swine herd. <laughs> so I asked him about that. I said, well, how did that one work, Ian? Why is it that you're not still a swine herd? And he said, well, it was because he was a swine herd on a large French winery. And uh, part of his job was to uh, slop the hogs every day to feed them. But he said it was a traditional winery, which meant that at grape stomping time, that's what they actually did. Everybody stripped off and stomped grapes and you know, basically had a back of nail for a while. And uh, he said that one of these was uh, such a festive occasion that uh, he passed out afterward, as did most of his fellows. And when he woke up, he realized that he had not yet fed the pigs. So he went out and threw them the, uh, the uh, the must, which is what you call the squashed grapes after you've extracted the, the juice from them. Uh, consequently, all of the pigs died of alcohol poisoning. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the end of his career as a swineherd. <laughs> Whereupon he took to writing crime novels. <laughs> Let's see, there's Jack White, another friend of mine. He is a Scot, uh, also from, uh, from Motherwell near Glasgow. He writes historical fiction as well, though his is set in post-Roman Britain rather than in Scotland. He was a cabaret singer and whiskey salesman prior to taking up the art. And then, of course, there's uh, Robert Burns, who we have all heard of, and Thomas Paine, one of the fathers of the American Revolution. Both of these gentlemen worked for His Majesty's Customs and Excise. You notice they were tax collectors, too. And as for me, well, as I say, I was an academic. Uh, my jobs have included things like the uh, postdoctoral appointment where I butchered seabirds for a living, um, and the one where I tortured boxfish. 
uh, a box fish is one of these little square guys that you see in aquariums, and they're very aptly named. They have a very rigid skeleton and uh, little fins that stick out at the side and go like that, and a little tail that goes like that at the back. They're what's called astracheiform swimmers, as opposed to the salmoniform swimmers, which go like this, and the anguilliform ones, which go like this. And yeah, this is what you do if you have a degree in marine biology, as you can <laughs> describe fish swimming. <laughs> But I was hired to uh, test something rather odd about astracheiform swimmers, which is if you take any uh, oxygen-using organism, which is most of us, and seal it in a sealed room or a water tunnel in this case, and you make it exercise, it burns more oxygen. Well, this is only reasonable. You know, you, you run, you break a sweat, you, <laughs> you huff, and you're using more oxygen. So if you graph you know, speed versus oxygen, the graph always goes up at a 45-degree angle. You go faster, you burn more oxygen. That's just the way it works unless you're a box fish. In this case, you go faster and faster, but you hit a certain speed and you stop burning more oxygen. You go faster and faster, but you're not using any more oxygen. So the man with whom I was working at UCLA had discovered this interesting fact, and of course we wanted to know why. So there were four hypotheses to test this, one of which was that they were doing something interesting with their fin kinematics. That is, uh, when you're walking, you probably know this, but the, the theory behind power walking is that it actually takes more energy to walk really fast than it does to break into a run. Running is more efficient in terms of muscular movement and what they call kinesiology. So they were thinking that maybe the box fish were doing something akin to breaking into a run when they hit that particular speed. And so the only way to tell this, because box fish move their fins very fast, is to uh, take high speed motion pictures of them while they swim. So that was my job. I built a water tunnel and I got a number of box fish, which all had to be flown in from Hawaii. I would go down to this giant warehouse next to LAX, which was just covered with you know, tanks full of octopi and things like that, and pick up my box fish and bring them back. And I always wondered what the box fish thought, you know, being snared in Hawaii and taken off to a water tunnel, <laughs> like the gulag. And uh, so I would then you know, drop them in, set up my camera, and uh, turn on a little fan at the end, which pushed water past them. Well, any fish will turn face on into a current. Uh, because the water goes over their gills, and uh, that's how they get oxygen from the water. So if they're facing into a current, they don't have to work very hard because the water is just flowing over their gills and refreshing them. So they'll all turn into the current. So I would turn it on, they'd turn into it, and they would swim to, to stay in the same place. I'd turn up the fan a little more, and they'd swim a little harder. And finally, I'd be turning it up all the way, and they'd be going <laughs> <laughs> And eventually, they'd go <laughs> and keel over backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, they turn off the fan hastily and scoop them out, take them off to a tank to recover. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, as I say, that was one of my jobs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, anyway, uh, what, the <laughs> what the background of most novelists uh, that I know of <laughs> suggests is that they hold jobs in which nobody really notices if they're slacking off or not. <laughs> So if you are a lawyer, a swine herd, or a, a box fish torturer, you know there's always these odd moments in the day when nobody's watching what you're doing and you can be writing. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, uh, well, let's see. Uh, I think, uh, as you may have mentioned earlier, that Sir Walter Scott was a very popular novelist of his day, and he still is in our day. Uh, this is because Sir Walter was a storyteller. Now, one of the questions that I often get asked in the interviews is, is there a difference between a storyteller and a novelist? And the answer is, yeah, I think there certainly is. Uh, I know a lot of really bad writers who tell good stories, Dan Brown being the guy who comes primarily to mind about that. <laughs> yeah, well, what's his name, who wrote The Bridges of Madison County being another one. But no, no, I mean, I have a whole list. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, uh, a story is a very specific thing. What you need to write a story is a character in a situation which produces conflict. Those are, that's it, I mean, that's all you need. And what you need is to uh, generate questions as you write. You want to uh, say, well, this happened and this happened, and you want your reader then to be saying, and then what happened? <laughs> and if you can keep them asking, and then what happened? You have a successful story. Okay, people like Dan Brown and the Da Vinci Code and so forth do that very successfully. I uh, actually have not read them much more than a few pages of the Da Vinci Code, but I had it at home and my younger daughter read it. And I said, oh, how, how do you like that? And she said, well, it's just terribly written, she said, but it's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> she was only 18 at the time, didn't read that much. She said, he info dumps all the way through the, through the chapter, and then he gives you this little cliffhanger at the end so he'll turn the page. <laughs> I said, yeah, good technique, you know, this is how it works. <laughs> yeah. Well, Sir Walter was extremely good at that, you know. And if you read any of his books with that in mind, you'll see exactly where that happens. Now, it doesn't have to be a big question that you, uh, that you raise when you're telling stories like that. It just has to be a little one. What comes next? Your character looks out the window and suddenly freezes. 
okay, your reader wants to know what's out the window, what do they see? You know, it may just be somebody riding across the lawn and you know, maybe it's the postman, you know, that's all right. But, uh, but maybe it's somebody bringing news and you don't know, so you want to find out. Okay, uh, someone knocks on the door. Immediately you want to know who's on the other side of the door. Well, maybe it's the butler, you know, maybe it's uh, his long lost son who he's never, never seen. Uh, you don't know and you want to know. So you raise all these little questions all the way through. So all storytellers do this. Um, not all novelists do that, interestingly enough. Uh, I'm not going to make invidious distinctions between genre and literary fiction because I think that's largely a false dichotomy. Uh, there's no reason why a book that is overtly genre, that is, that you could uh, tell on the basis of its plot or its, con or its conventions, you know, should belong in this genre or that genre, why it should not be written with equal craft and sensitivity and facility to a, uh, a literary novel. But the thing is, genre novels are basically grouped around uh, what you might call the big human archetypes. You know, romance novels are concerned with love, with forming of pair bonds. Okay, this is kind of the basis of our, uh, of our roots as a species. It's very important to us. And that's why that kind of story, a courtship story, is kind of universally appealing. All right, you find romance ev everywhere. Now, in Sir Walter's uh, day, romance had a much wider meaning. It didn't mean only a courtship story or only a love story, though he certainly employed both. It meant anything that was outside ordinary experience, anything that kind of expanded your horizons and let you experience things that you normally wouldn't in your daily life. All right, these days uh, that still happens in romance novels, but uh, also in other kinds. Well, we have other, uh, other genres, uh, for instance, speculative fiction, science fiction, and so forth. This uh, kind of satisfies our curiosity. Uh, human beings as a, as a species are extremely curious. We want to know how things work. What would happen if, you know? And uh, so all of these things kind of come into play. Westerns, for instance, uh, deal with um, you know, uh, the questions of identity and self-determination. Uh, so all of the genres group around these large, uh, large archetypes. Mystery, of course, is all about social contract and the breaking of social contract. If you have a murder, it has to be solved. My husband once asked me, well, why does it have to be solved? You know, who cares? And I said, it has to be solved because otherwise your society falls apart. You know, people care if someone has, has been unjustly killed. You need to find out how, and, you know, justice needs to be served in one way or another. It's a basic human uh, desire. You see it in all the great religions of the world. They say, thou shalt not kill. I mean, you don't kill. And if you do, then, you know, there are consequences. So this is also another important kind of fiction that we have. All right, now as I say, uh, literary fiction often uh, uses bits and pieces of these, ar of these uh, big archetypes, but there's other literary fiction that kind of uh, is out around the, the edges. This is much more individual and is concerned more with the exploration of individual people and uh, you know how they live out their lives thematically, you might say. That's why it sells less well than genre fiction. And I don't mean anything invidious, as I say, against literary fiction by saying that. But it's working without the magnetism of those big social archetypes that genre fiction has. Okay, now as I say, I don't personally see any difference between those. When I first began writing, I, uh, I've known since I was about eight years old that I was a writer, that I was supposed to write novels but I didn't know how, and as I say, very few people do. You pretty much figure it out as you go along one way or another. I uh, came from a very conservative family background. My father was fond of saying to me, well, you're such a poor judge of character, you're bound to marry some bum, he said. So um, <laughs> be sure you get a good education so you can support your children. <laughs> So with this going on at home, I thought, well, perhaps I would not announce that I wanted to be a writer. I realized this was not very financially stable. Um, and so I went into science. You know, I liked science. I was good at it. But I still knew I wanted to be a writer. And uh, what happened, basically, was that I turned 35. And I said to myself, well, you know, Mozart was dead at 36. Maybe better get a move on here. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I said, all right, on my next birthday, I'm going to begin writing a novel. Because up to this point, I had written all kinds of everything. I uh, did not marry a bum, as it happens. I married a very nice man, who I still have 40 years later. But uh, he did quit work three months after our first child was born to start his own business. And I do have to say that in terms of financial stability, there's not that much to choose between an entrepreneur and a bum. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So for our first few years, I was, in fact, the sole support of the family. And they don't pay assistant professors very much in the sciences. So I was looking for ways and means of earning extra money. And I, uh, at this point, owing to a series of academic accidents, had kind of slid sideways and become an expert in scientific computation. 
it, it's really easy to be an expert if you're the only person in the, in the world who does it. And uh, I, I was one of about six at this point in the mid 80s. So I, uh, I started a uh, journal called Science Software Quarterly, which was for a scholarly journal for scientists who use computers in their work. And I did international seminars for people who wanted to do laboratory automation and all that. This actually has something to do with how I got published, is why I'm telling you this. But um, <laughs> yeah, like I say, all novelists find their own way to publication. <laughs> and it's a very screwy path often. Anyway, um, as a result of, of one of the reviews I did, I got a package from Byte magazine along with a trial membership to CompuServe. Well, this was the mid-80s. It was a long time before the web as we now know it. This was a long time even before AOL and chat rooms. And uh, there were these three big information services, Genie, Delphi, and CompuServe. That's all there was. Well, Byte said uh, the software manufacturer has a support forum on CompuServe that services their software, and they'd like you to check it out and mention it in your review. I said, fine. So I logged on, checked it out, everything was fine. Well, um, I had four hours of free connect time left after I did that. And I am not Scottish, but I was not going to waste $120 in free connect time, which was how much <laughs> it was worth back then. So I said, OK, um, what else is in here? So I began exploring, and I came across a group of people called the Literary Forum. Uh, this was, and still is, we're still going, now we're called the Books and Writers Community. But it's the same uh, batch of people. It's a bulletin board system of people who like to talk about books. There were a few writers there, there are more now, but mostly it's just people who like to read and talk about books. And uh, for someone with two full-time jobs and three small children under the age of six, it was the, in, uh, the ideal social life. So I uh, you know, <laughs> signed up and began logging in regularly. Okay, well in addition to writing software reviews and things like that, I wrote grant proposals and uh, textbooks and uh, tutorials and uh, standardized exams and uh, basically anything anyone would pay me for, including Walt Disney comic books. I began writing these in the late 70s and that was more fun than anything else, but they did pay $17 a page. So the point here is that I had written all this stuff and no one had ever shown me how to write any of it, including the comic books. I had just read a number of examples and then I wrote one and if it didn't look quite right, I poked it till it did. So I said, uh, well, you know, you've been reading novels for 30 odd years, surely if you write one, you will recognize it. So I said, um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> better write a novel, <laughs> okay? And this seemed like the best way of learning what, what it took to write a novel in terms of you know, daily commitment and mental discipline and organization and research, because I'd never written a novel before. So I said, fine, I'm gonna write a novel. All right, what kind of book shall I write? Okay, I read everything and lots of it, but maybe more mysteries than anything else. And I thought, well, maybe I should write a mystery. And I said, no mysteries have plots. I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> and uh, so I said, what's the easiest possible kind of book I could write for practice? And I said, well, for me, perhaps a historical novel would be the easiest. Because I was a research professor, I knew my way around a library. I said, it seems easier to look things up than make them up. And if I turned out to have no imagination, I can steal things from the historical record. <laughs> <laughs> which works extremely well. Sir Walter Scott did it to great effect all the time. <laughs> so I said, fine, historical novel, where shall I set this? Now, Sir Walter came to Scottish fiction rather naturally, being a Scot and in close conjunction with all these stories and this rich cultural heritage. I came to it uh, through Doctor Who. <laughs> For those of you who are not familiar with Doctor Who, uh, it's a really old, really long-running uh, TV show produced in Great Britain where it was originally done as a children's show. Now it's uh, much more for adults. <laughs> but it's been running for 65 years, I think. And um, I was looking for a time and place in which to set this putative historical novel, because I have no background in history other than the six hours of Western civilization they make you take as an undergraduate. <laughs> so you know, any time would have done as well as another. I'd have to look it all up anyway. So I was casting around looking for a good time and place when I happened to see a really old Doctor Who rerun on public television. Well, this show had to have been done 50 years ago, but in it, the Doctor, who is a Time Lord from the planet Gallifrey and travels through space and time having adventures, and in the course of this, he picks up companions from different periods of Earth's history, because he thinks Earthlings are funny, mostly. And in this very old show, he had picked up a young Scotsman from 1745. Well, this was an 18, 19-year-old young man who appeared in his kilt, and I said, well, that's fetching. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And I found myself still thinking about this the next day <laughs> in church. And I said, um, <laughs> said, well, you know, you want to write a book. The important thing is to pick a point and start in. So I said, fine, Scotland, 18th century. So that's where I began, knowing nothing about Scotland or the 18th century, having no plot, no outline, and no characters. <laughs> nothing but the rather vague images conjured up by the notion of a man in a kilt. <laughs> which as you will all agree is a very powerful and compelling image. 
<laughs> yes, I'll invite you not to turn around and stare at John in the back. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, in fact, uh, my sixth book was a, was a very lucky novel for me. It opened at number one on several bestseller lists in different countries at the same time. And it won me the uh, Corina International Prize for Fiction, which was very cool. I got to go to Germany to accept it, which was also very cool. Well, while I was there, the German publisher had me interviewed by absolutely everyone in the German press, you know, from the tabloid newspapers up to the equivalent of Vanity Fair. And uh, toward the end of this very long week, uh, I was being interviewed by a nice gentleman from their literary press. And he said, oh, I've read your entire work. He said, your imagery is just transcendental. You know, your narrative drive is tremendous. Your characters are so three-dimensional. I'm thinking, yes, yes, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, instead, he paused and he said, uh, there's just this one thing. I wonder, could you explain to me what is the appeal of a man in a kilt? <laughs> well, he was a German, you know. Anyway, I, uh, <laughs> I was really tired, or I might not have said it, but I just looked at him for a minute, and I said, well, I suppose it's the idea that you could be up against a wall with him in a minute. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> so in a nutshell, that's why I write Scottish fiction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people often ask me, you know, what do the Scots think of your work? And uh, luckily, most of them seem very receptive. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I have never yet had a Scot complain about my portrayal, and I find that very, very flattering and gratifying indeed. Uh, the first time I went to Scotland on a book tour, uh, which was about my third book, I, was, uh, I dropped into Mingy's bookstore in Edinburgh. They weren't uh, actually expecting me. I just got in to see if they had any stock I could sign, but I introduced myself. And uh, there's this very peculiar thing about Scottish bookstores. Uh, they have a very rich literary heritage of which they are justifiably proud. And all Scottish bookstores have a separate section called Scottish fiction. They have regular fiction, and then there is Scottish fiction. And um, uh, much to my pleasure, they had put me in the Scottish fiction section. <laughs> So I said to the store manager, you know, how flattered I was at this, this propinquity. And he looked at me and he said, well, you know, Gabaldon is such an odd name. We thought it might quite well be Scottish. <laughs> 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 Even after finding out the truth, it didn't move me, though. So I, I remain a Scottish writer <laughs> as far as they're concerned. Yeah. Anyway, now, uh, just a few notes about historical fiction. Um, Sir Walter was... Uh, one of the first, if not absolutely the first, uh, writer of, of historical novels as, as a genre unto itself, and certainly one of the first popularizers of the, that uh, thing. Historical fiction, uh, historically, goes in cycles. It sells really well for a while, and then it drops completely off the map, and then it comes back, and then it drops off. And publishers have always been curious as to why this is. Well, being a writer of historical fiction, I think I can tell them that. It's because of the, uh, the changes in the demographic of the people that are reading it you uh, don't find that many teenagers reading historical fiction. I mean, I find a lot of teenagers reading mine, but they're reading it for the sex. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, uh, whereas, you know, uh, generally speaking, people uh, start reading historical fiction in their late 30s or early 40s, because this is the point at which you realize your mortality. And uh, you start, uh, start placing yourself in context. You start looking backward and saying, you know, uh, you know, how does our society measure up? You know, are we, are we doing as well as our parents, as our grandparents? And uh, so you're, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you're looking for um, sort of confirmation, I guess it is, that you're, that you're doing okay. And um, the other thing is that uh, historical fiction thrives in, uh, in times of anxiety. If, uh, if things are really bad, people read historical fiction. Because if you read historical fiction, you have assurance that things worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Mm. I don't actually have laryngitis. I just sound like this all the time anyway. <laughs> but <laughs> Thank you. But anyway, uh, so uh, concerns with historical novelists. Okay, um, yeah. Okay, well, the first thing there is what's history? You know, if you're a historical novelist, what is it that you're using as your raw material? Uh, people assume history is basically what happened, you know, and in the broadest sense, they're right. The thing is that history is not what happened. 
History is what people chose to write down about it, and that's not always the same thing. It's actually not ever the same thing. Uh, I don't know if any of you in college ever had one of those psychology classes where they had you know, somebody rush in with a gun and then pretend to shoot somebody else and rush out, and then they uh, pulled the class to get a description of the suspect. You know, how tall was he? What was he wearing? You know, did he hold the gun in his right hand or his left? And they'd have everybody write down their answers, and they'd read the answers and realize that no two people had seen the same thing even though it was the same incident, you know, identifiably the same objective reality, but, uh, but nobody sees the same thing ever. So consequently, when people write down history, they're writing down, in some cases, very honestly, what they themselves perceive to be reality. But it's their version of reality, and you have to bear in mind who wrote it. Anytime you look for a primary source in history, you say, who wrote this? You know, why did they write it? What did they have in mind? You know, what was their, what was their purpose in writing it? If it's a letter or someone's uh, diary, you can be reasonably sure they were writing, you know, honestly, this is what I saw, this is what I thought, and so forth. Whereas if they were writing for a newspaper, that's not necessarily the case. Okay, I'm, I've been for some time working on an essay called History and the Three Levels of Lies, <laughs> because that's pretty much what history is. The first one is the un inadvertent or unwitting lie, that is the unavoidable selective reporting. Nobody's going to see the same thing. Whatever they write down, it's going to be different. And they're not usually doing it uh, on purpose, but errors come in. Um, I have myself been, well, I've been writing for 20, 22 years. My first book was published 20 years ago. And in that time, I've been interviewed literally hundreds of times, hundreds and hundreds of times. And I see not a few of those <laughs> interviews. Okay, out of maybe 800 interviews that I've read in the last 10 years, Two had no errors, only two. And an interview in a newspaper is, you know, six inches of supposed facts. You know, how, how far astray could they go? Well, uh, not, well, it depends. If it's a UK tabloid, they can go really far astray. <laughs> but no, and they get paid for it, which is outrageous. But uh, no, if, uh, if they're just reporting generally, generally they are. I mean, I'm an author. I'm not controversial at all. They, they have no, uh, no really real motive in, in making things wrong. But for instance, um, I grew up in Arizona. Arizona has uh, three cities that have universities. There's Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff, which is where I grew up and where I got two of my degrees, three if you count the honorary one they gave me for being a commencement speaker. And uh, then there's Arizona State University, which is in the middle of the state, that's the biggest one. And then there is the University of Arizona in Tucson, which is down south. Okay, all three of those have the word Arizona and university in their title. Okay, and if I asked you at this particular moment, quick, which one did I go to school at? You might have trouble. <laughs> okay, well, so do the interviewers, yeah, <laughs> okay. So consequently, I read a lot of interviews that say, oh, she worked at the University of Arizona or she went to Arizona State University. Okay, it's a totally harmless error. It doesn't make any difference to anybody where I went to school or where I worked, except, as I say, consider. If you were a historian working 50 years from now and for some unknown reason you had decided to research me for your project or your book or whatever, you'd be digging up all this stuff, you'd be reading it. You'd be reading this and you'd be saying, oh, she went to, uh, to the University of Arizona. Well, let me go and see if I can find anyone who, who, you know, who is old enough to have talked to her or known her when she was there. So they go there and find out that I had never been there. Well, what would they conclude? You know, that I was a liar and I'd made up my entire academic history? <laughs> or would it occur to them that whoever uh, did the interview just didn't pay enough attention to be able to separate the three universities? <laughs> it's that kind of error that's the inadvertent or unwilling or uh, just off the cuff uh, first level of lies. Okay, the second level of lies is uh, deliberate bias but no means to, or no urge to mess with the facts as such. It's just a you know, deliberate bias in which facts they choose to report. And you'll see this on the morning news every single morning, <laughs> no matter whether you're reading the newspaper or watching the television or listening to the radio. You're going to have a very deliberate bias, and most people select their listening or their reading on that basis. You know what you're getting if you're listening to Fox News or CNN. You know what you're getting if you're uh, reading the New York Times versus the Wall Street Journal. I recommend the Wall Street Journal, by the way, a very good newspaper. Uh, <laughs> great op-ed page. Yeah. So anyway, uh, the second level of lies is where you have a deliberate uh, bias. That's deliberate selection of facts to support a case or achieve a particular effect, and, but without any necessity of messing with actual facts. You know, the fact is that Casey Anthony was acquitted of uh, murdering her daughter today. And uh, you know, people have all kinds of opinions about that, but that's the basic fact, that's what happened. And you will in fact see that fact advertised or talked about on all the news uh, channels that there are. But everybody's gonna have their own take on it, what they think about it, why they think that happened, you know, what kind of effect, what does this say about our judicial system, et cetera, et cetera. Well, all that is where the bias comes in, or the lies. Okay, the third level of lies is deliberate lies. 
and people actually do this, appalling as the thought is, but uh, people uh, you know, conduct propaganda campaigns. Uh, they will, it's, actually we call it spin these days, but it's lying. You know, I was born a Catholic, I know it when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, the thing is, if you're a historical novelist, you have different standards than, a, uh, than an actual historian does um, in what you take, and you uh, can take a lot of this lying and, and turn it to good effect. For instance, if you're dealing with the, uh, the first level of lies with unwitting uh, bias on the part of the observer, well, as I say, you ask yourself when you read one of these accounts, who wrote this? What was, what was their bias? Can you figure that out? Uh, a good novelist will employ the bias as well as the actual account by absorbing the reporter and his or her viewpoint into the story. You know, uh, writing fiction is a very cannibalistic art. <laughs> That's how you do it. Um, but anyway, um, I just wanted to mention, since I'm bringing us briefly back to Sir Walter here, is that uh, he and I have something in common besides just what we wrote about, and that's the background from which we wrote it. Not necessarily the professional background, but what you might call the intellectual background. Both law and science rest on uh, several uh, related skills, which are close observation, attention to detail, an attempt to discern and describe reality. Now, a lawyer has a different motive for discerning and describing reality than a, science, uh, than a scientist does. Uh, it may be just so that they can pervert the course of justice, but they need to know what reality was to start with, and so does a scientist. But in addition to these basic skills, then you need to uh, be able to render reality into fiction, and that's something else. That's a different skill entirely, and you don't necessarily need to have been a lawyer or a scientist or anything of that sort in order to do that. But that is a commonality of, of skills between us. Uh, let's see, I think I'll skip the ethics of historical fiction. I don't think anybody really cares about that. It's, uh, it's, it's basically uh, can, how far can you badmouth historical people? You know, uh, if you have to have George Washington in your story, you didn't know George Washington. Uh, there's tons of stuff written about him, which comes from all three levels of lies. Uh, how much of an effort are you gonna make to figure out where the truth lay, and how are you gonna treat him in your, uh, in your story? Um, some people have no compunction about bad-mouthing uh, historical figures right, left, and sideways. Others are so ethical about it that they'll barely use a historical figure, even if he or she was plainly there and important. I kind of fall midway. I read as much as I can find of uh, the person's actual writing as a, as a means of kind of gauging what their baseline was, and then I try not to portray them as being any worse than I know them to have been, in fact. You know, lots of them were really bad. And <laughs> then you have a free hand. <laughs> On the other hand, you have people like Benedict uh, Arnold, who is not as bad as you think he was, which you will find out in the next book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I should maybe mention cultural prejudice. Uh, uh, on the part of readers and so forth. Um, most people don't actually realize they're doing this, but it is not at all uncommon for people to come up to me and ask me, what are you? You know, by looking at me. Uh, what they mean is what's my ethnic background because they can't tell by looking at me just that I look rather exotic to them. Um, a lot of people think I am a Native American, uh, which I'm not, um, or a Russian <laughs> or a French. None of those are the case. Uh, my dad's people are from New Mexico, originally from Spain about 500 years before that. And uh, so it's a Latina on that side. So that's where the coloring comes from. However, my mother's people are from England and uh, with one branch of Germans who got in around the time of the American Revolution. And uh, <laughs> what you're looking at is German bones with, uh, with Spanish coloring. <laughs> in other words, I'm a prime example of hybrid vigor. <laughs> but when I explain this to people, what do they say? They say, oh, why don't you write books set in Spain? <laughs> which always makes me want to slap them across the face, but I don't. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> you know, I want to, what I do say is, why? Why would I do that? You know, if I were uh, a 40-year-old white male, you know, and my last name was Torgudson, would you say, why don't you write books set in Sweden? No, you would not. <laughs> you know, um, uh, but it's only people who uh, um, come from what they think is a minority background that they believe ought to be writing books about what they think that background is. Okay, now I am in fact Hispanic on one side, 50% of my genes are from there. I did not, however, grow up in a barrio. I, <laughs> I didn't even grow up speaking Spanish. <laughs> I was raised pretty much culturally on the English side of my heritage. Uh, mind you, my father was the youngest of 15 children. I have literally seven or 800 cousins on that side. And, uh, <laughs> and I did learn to speak Spanish in later life. And uh, you know, I know a lot about the general culture of New Mexico and all that. But still, you know, it's, it's, it's 
not closer to me than the other side of my culture. I mean, do you see a dividing line anywhere? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, every, the thing about right, being a novelist is that uh, you can be anybody, anytime, anywhere. You know, it's a, a very freeing sort of thing. And you don't need to write about your own ethnicity. <laughs> That's, it's a silly thing about write what you know. That's actually phrased wrong. It isn't write what you know, because if people wrote only what they knew, we wouldn't have any good books at all. Um, but uh, <laughs> uh, what it should say is, don't write stuff you don't know anything about. But the thing is, if you want to write about something, you can find out. Um, when I chose to write about Scotland, as I say, I knew nothing about Scotland, except you know that men wore kilts, and that was enough for it to be going on with. But um, I went immediately to the uh, library and began looking up Scotland in the 18th century. Well, the only thing I knew about writing novels was that they should have conflict. And I said, okay, let's look for conflict in the 18th century in Scotland. Well, you don't do that very long without running smack into Bonnie Prince Charlie. And I said, okay, that looks like conflict. We'll use the Jacobite Rising. And I said, now I must have a lot of Scotsmen because of the kilt factor, but uh, <laughs> I think it would be a good idea if I had a female character to play off these guys and we'll have sexual tension, that's conflict, that's good. So about the third day of writing, I introduced this uh, female character. I said, uh, essentially, we've got Scots versus English. If I make her English, we'll have lots of conflict. And uh, so I loosed this English woman into a cottage full of Scotsmen to see what she'd do. And I had no idea who she was, what she was called, or how she would get along, but you know, there she was. She walked in, they were all crouched around the hearth muttering, and they turned around and stared at her. I'm thinking, why, does she look funny? What's going on here? But one of them drew himself up, and he said, my name's Dougal Mackenzie, and uh, who might you be? And without my stopping to think, I just typed, my name's Claire Elizabeth Beecham, and who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you don't sound at all like an 18th century person. Uh, so I fought with her for several pages, trying to beat her into shape and make her talk like a historical person. Um, but she wasn't having any. She just kept making smart-ass modern remarks. And uh, she also took over and started telling the story herself. And I said, well, I'm not going to fight with you all the way through this book. And I said, uh, no one's ever going to see this. It doesn't matter what bizarre thing I do. Go ahead and be modern. I'll figure out how you got there later. So it's all her fault that there's time travel in these books. <laughs> Which leads me conveniently uh, to, uh, to my closing, you might say, and the last point of, uh, of uh, similarity between myself and Sir Walter Scott, which is uh, the theme of this symposium, for those of you who haven't been in it, is uh, Sir Walter Scott, sheriff and outlaw. Okay, a novelist of any sort uh, is always the sheriff of their own books. You, uh, you make the laws, you enforce the laws, and the people in your books usually obey them just about as well as the common populace obeys statutory laws, which is to say they do it when they feel like it. And, um, but you do make the laws, so you are the sheriff of the book. But a good novelist, and uh, note that adjective, a good novelist is always an outlaw as well, because a good novelist is a law unto themselves. <laughs> okay, thank you. much. This is sort of a coda here. I had forgotten just that I had this. Um, one of the gentlemen I had dinner with was saying, oh, are you going to read something tonight? Because he really liked to uh, hear things hot, uh, close to creation, as he put it. And since some of you are readers rather than scholars and so forth, I thought you might also like to hear a small piece just to prove that I have actually been working. So. <laughs> takes us about 30 seconds to come back up, assuming that his battery hasn't died in the meantime. <laughs> Resuming windows, okay. Good moment to have a quick drink. <laughs> right, now I am actually in the throes of finishing a book called Scottish Prisoner, which is uh, an uh, interesting book. It's one of the smaller Lord John books. But it's different in that this one is a two-person book. It's got an alternating viewpoint between Jamie Fraser and Lord John. So half of the book is, in fact, Jamie's done from his viewpoint and uh, uh, telling about him. Uh, I do, however, also have book eight, which is the sequel to uh, An Echo in the Bone. Now, An Echo in the Bone uh, <laughs> ended with a uh, brilliantly conceived and executed triple cliffhanger. <laughs> 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 Like my husband said when I told him about it, he looked at me and said, oh, they're going to scream. 
I said, well, they will, but on the other hand, they'll be sure there's another book coming, which was my <laughs> point, <laughs> because I had so many people after Breath of Snow and Ashes, the sixth book, uh, call or write me and say, oh, we're so sad that the story is over. You know, how will we do without Jamie and Claire? I wrote back to every one of those people, and I said, what makes you think the story is over? Did I say it was over? Did it say the thrilling conclusion on the paperback? No. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, they all wrote back to me and said, oh, but you tied everything up so neatly, we thought it must be the end. <laughs> I said, well, see if I do that again. <laughs> <laughs> so in fact, I did not. <laughs> okay, let's see what I can find here. All right, excerpt, excerpt, excerpt. Not, oh yeah, okay, there we go. I really hate Microsoft Word. <laughs> Come on. The minute you open it, it all shoots over to one side of the screen. <laughs> There it is, okay, all right. All right, so I thought that I would uh, tonight uh, read you a small bit from book eight to just to prove that I have actually been working on it. Okay, one of the triple uh, cliffhangers occurred toward the end of the book when um, Jamie Fraser returns from the dead. Okay, he has been supposed to have been drowned and in order to avoid being arrested as a spy, his uh, beloved wife, Claire, was very devoted to him, is obliged to marry uh, Lord John Gray. Now, Lord John is a very good friend of the family, a very, um, Jamie's best friend, essentially. Now, he is also homosexual in a time when that would get you hanged. It was a capital offense, therefore he's very deeply closeted. Now, Jamie and Claire both know this, and in fact, uh, Lord John has been in love with Jamie for quite some time, and Jamie had a number of problems with this to start with, but has come to terms with it over the years. <laughs> okay, uh, well, while uh, in the throes of grief and peach brandy one night, uh, Lord John and Claire go to bed together. And uh, the next day, Jamie turns up alive. <laughs> <laughs> Consequently, a number of other things happen. Uh, he's being pursued by the British soldiers in Philadelphia at the moment and is forced to flee from the house before more than a token appearance. But uh, he takes Lord John with him as a hostage to ensure that he's going to get out of Philadelphia alive. So they're riding through Philadelphia, and Lord John is thinking, I've got to tell him. You know? <laughs> I've got to tell him before he has a chance to talk to Claire because she can't keep secrets. She'll tell him immediately. <laughs> and and you know, he's an honorable sort. So anyway, he's convinced that Jamie's going to kill him as soon as he says so. But uh, he's so wrought up that by the time they finally come to a stop, he blurts out, I have had carnal knowledge of your wife. At which uh, Jamie looks at him curiously and says, oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> and that was how that ended in Echo in the Bone. <laughs> so this is what happened next. <laughs> He'd been quite resigned to dying, had expected it from the moment that he would blurted out, I have had carnal knowledge of your wife. The only question in his mind had been whether Fraser would shoot him, stab him, or eviscerate him with his bare hands. To have the injured husband regard him calmly and say merely, oh, why, was not merely unexpected, but infamous, absolutely infamous. Why, John Gray repeated, incredulous. Did you say why? <laughs> I did, and I should appreciate an answer. <laughs> now that Gray had both eyes open, he could see that Fraser's outward calm was not quite so impervious as he'd first supposed. There was a pulse beating in Fraser's temple, and he'd shifted his weight a little, like a man might do in the vicinity of a tavern brawl, not quite ready to commit violence, but readying himself to meet it. Perversely, Gray found this sight steadying. What do you bloody mean? Why? He said, suddenly irritated. And why aren't you fucking dead? <laughs> I often wonder that myself, Fraser replied politely. I take it you thought I was. Yes, and so did your wife. Do you have the faintest idea what the knowledge of your death did to her? The dark blue eyes narrowed just a trifle. Are you implying that the news of my death deranged her to such an extent that she lost her reason and took you to her bed by force? <laughs> <laughs> because, he went on, neatly cutting off Gray's heated reply, unless I've been seriously misled regarding your own nature, it would take substantial force to compel you to any such action. <laughs> or am I wrong? The eyes stayed narrow. Gray stared back at them. Then he closed his own eyes briefly and rubbed both hands hard over his face like a man waking from nightmare. He dropped his hands and opened his eyes again. You are not misled, he said through clenched teeth, and you are wrong. Fraser's ruddy eyebrows shot up, in genuine astonishment, he thought. You went to her because, from desire? His voice rose too. And she let you? I didn't believe it. <laughs> the color was creeping up Fraser's tanned neck, vivid as a climbing rose. Gray had seen that happen before, and decided recklessly that the best, the only defense, was to lose his own temper first. It was a relief. We thought you were dead, you bloody asshole, he said furious. <laughs> Both of us, dead, and we, we took too much to drink one night. Very much too much. We spoke of you, and uh, damn you, neither one of us was making love to the other. We were fucking you. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Fraser's face went abruptly blank and his jaw dropped. <laughs> Gray enjoyed one split second of satisfaction at the sight before a massive fist came up hard beneath his ribs and he hurtled backwards, staggered a few steps further and fell. He lay in the leaves, completely winded, mouth opening and closing like an automaton's. All right then, he thought dimly, bare hands it is. <laughs> the hands wrapped themselves in his shirt and jerked him to his feet. He managed to stand and a wisp of air seeped into his lungs. Fraser's face was an inch from his. Fraser was in fact so close that he couldn't see the man's expression, only a close up view of two bloodshot blue eyes, both of them berserk. That was enough. He felt quite calm now. It wouldn't take long. You tell me exactly what happened, you filthy wee pervert, Fraser whispered, his breath hot on Gray's face and smelling of ale. He shook Gray slightly. Every word, every motion, everything. <laughs> Gray got just enough breath to answer. No, he said definitely. Go ahead and kill me. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, I'm Susan Simpson from the Public Library, and we have been collecting questions from the audience. I have sorted them into groups because there are themes in the questions, but if you have a question that you haven't turned in, would you please send it to the center aisle so they can whisk it to the front of the room? Do you see how many there are? Okay. This was by the... Yeah. Or on an outline for five seasons or whatever. 
and there are intents to develop those in parallel until one or the other attracts enough financing and we're off to the races. So, you know, it's one of those things where you kind of don't hold your breath, but you know, something might happen fairly soon. Okay. Um, oh, if an option expires without them being able to do something, then you have options. You can uh, relicense it for, you know, possibly more money for the same outfit. You can sell it to someone else. You can decide that you're not interested in making but you just hold on to it. But uh, many um, authors actually live on their option fees because many more books are optioned than are ever made into movies. Okay. Well, coming to the actor thing. Um, I've never seen any actors who actually look like Jamie McFarland. <laughs> That's kind of not the point. Uh, an actor actually has an art. You know, they're an artist as much as a novelist or a sculptor or a painter. And they're an artist to embody somebody that they want. Okay. Um, so actual physical similarity, uh, even on a superficial level, is probably not as important as the actual ability to act like Shane or Claire. And you can't tell whether they can do that without seeing them, which is why you have casting directors. So uh, by and large, I would have said uh, until recently, no, I have no idea. But uh, uh, as it is, I need to tell you about Outlander, the musical. Okay. Yes, you can laugh. <laughs> <laughs> About two years ago, I was in Scotland, and this nice gentleman named Mike Gibb came to talk to me, and he said, I'm a lyricist and playwright, and with my friend Kevin, who's a composer, we've done several you know, uh, produ musical productions of toured throughout Britain uh, fairly well. We uh, sell the CDs of the, of the uh, scores off our website. Anyway, we've fallen madly in love with your book, Outlander, and we would like to do Outlander the Musical. I laughed, and I said, that's the shrewdest thing I've ever heard of, tell me more. So, <laughs> And they said, we'd like to start by doing a concept CD, which is where we compose uh, that's under 14 songs that will uh, capture the emotional high points of the story and tell it in a sort of arc. We'll sell this as a CD, and if there seems to be popular support for it, we'll go ahead and write the libretto, and we'll start uh, writing them out on actual stage production. I said, OK, go ahead. Well, they did. And it turned out beautifully. So the CD is, is available. In fact, if any of you get the, the 20th anniversary edition of Outlander, which I see they have, it actually has a sampler CD from Outlander, the musical. It's got uh, four songs from them. But they did a wonderful job. Anyway, the point here is that uh, since they did foresee uh, doing it as an actual stage production, they cast the actors accordingly. And for J and the young man who sings Jamie is a uh, actor from Edinburgh named Alan Scott Douglas, who is six foot four with red hair. <laughs> very intelligent, very funny kid. But uh, he's only 28, and therefore presumably he remembers what it was like to be a virgin. So that's um, <laughs> important. <laughs> I mean, people keep recommending Kevin McKinn to me and uh, you know, Gerard Butler and so forth. And both of them are wonderful actors, but you know, an actor you know, pushing 40, you know, there's no way they can act like a 22 year old version. And I'm not sure I would like to see them try. <laughs> seeing Alan act in a uh, fringe play in Edinburgh. It was a wretched play, but he had three different parts, and he's one of these actors who can actually be someone different in each part. So, uh, you know, if I were forced to say who I'd like is Jamie, I guess I would name him. Um, that's partly because I don't know anybody else, but I think he probably could do it. Claire? Claire? Your guess is as good as mine. You know, there are dozens, literally, of people who physically could do it, so it would be a matter of whether he or she had a decent English accent, which I certainly go for, or was English, which would be even better. <laughs> what is the proper pronunciation of your last name? Oh, well, good question. If you were speaking Spanish, it would be Galadon, which is why there's a long O in the last syllable. If you're speaking English, it's usually Galadon, but there's still a long O in the last syllable. It rhymes with stone. It's the easiest way to remember it. This is a, um, a writer's question. How much do you revise? And how do you go about it? <coughs> well, interesting question, but there's not a simple answer. Um, I'm not one of the people who kind of whack down a rough draft and then go back and fiddle with it. I fiddle with it while I'm writing it, um, which is I don't write with an outline and I don't write in a straight line. I write in small bits and pieces where I can see things happening. So to begin on any given thing, what I need is a kernel, which is a very vivid image, a line of dialogue, anything I can sense concretely. And I'll write that down in a line or two as best I can. You know, this is my estimation of objective reality. And uh, then I sit there and stare at it. And I take words out and I put them back. And I move half the pause down and write in another one. And I move it back. <laughs> anyway, I fiddle. And while I'm doing that, my mind is kicking up questions. You know, what time of day is it? How is the light falling? Uh, the light's coming in low. It must be winter. It has that blue tinge to it. Okay. If it's winter and my cold, yes, my fingers are cold. And so is my nose, but my feet 
start from a state of fire, right? So there's a fire, there's a dog by the fire, I've never seen him before. That's how it works, but <laughs> very slow and, and painstaking. And I work backward and forward and backward and forward from my kernel, you know, adding, subtracting, and picking and choosing. And I will have been through a scene literally hundreds of times before it's done. But when it is done, it's as good as I can make it at that point, and I will leave it then and go and find another scene. So I have these handfuls of disconnected scenes to begin with, but gradually they begin to stick together. I'll write something and think, oh, that explains why this happened, and I can move things together, and I see a bigger piece, and I know what has to happen next, so I can write that, and I have this sort of L-shaped piece, sort of like playing Tetris in your head, and all these pieces are kind of joining up. Well, at the same time, I'm generating a, a timeline in the back of my head from the research that I'm doing and you know, putting in the, uh, the events that I think I want to live through or refer to, so I know what order they occur. You know? And once I've got what I call chunks, this would be 40 to 60 pages of continuous stuff, uh, if I've got four or five of those, I can line those up against my timeline. When they block, I'll then see what the internal shape of that book is. All my books have an internal geometric shape, and it's usually invisible to the reader, though you could see it if I told you what it was for any book. And in fact, there's an essay in the back of the 20th anniversary edition that tells you just that. But um, anyway, once I've seen the shape, the writing gets a lot faster, um, but I'm still doing this picking and choosing. So essentially, I'm revising all the time that I'm writing. People are really interested in the characters. Do you think about the characters all the time? I think and dream about them. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I have a life. <laughs> someplace that's evocative of them, if I'm on Scotland, for instance, or if I'm in a museum and passing through the, the 18th century portraits, things like that, I'll be paying attention and, you know, they'll sort of be there sitting on my shoulder, as it were, but I don't, I, I don't ever dream about them. This may be because I work late at night, and by the time I go to bed, you know, I've exhausted everything I knew about them, so <laughs> my mind is empty at 4.30 in the morning. You mentioned that it wasn't the last book that the paperback didn't say stunning conclusion. No, it isn't. <laughs> this person says, asks, are you going to have a final book out in the Outlander series? If so, when? Well, if I live long enough, sure. By <laughs> <laughs> uh, which I mean, certainly there's a book that comes after an echo in the bone. As I said, that ended with a triple cliffhanger, so people would be sure there was another book. But I don't know whether book eight is the last book or not. It, uh, it might be, but I don't know that yet. Uh, there might be nine. You know, a triple trilogy sounds aesthetically pleasing, but I don't know. It's, it's all a matter of where the story comes from. I guess it has, a, it has its own shape. Once I've seen the shape, it doesn't change. But I haven't seen the shape for book eight yet, so I don't know. Once I've seen the shape, then I'll know if there's another book after that or not. But as for book eight, with any luck, I'll finish writing it around the end of 2012. This is going to be the last one, and it's a change of pace. Okay. <laughs> My ambition is to become a marine of Santa Cruz, uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Woods Hole. Um, there are about six. The University of Hawaii is another one, and I forget the other two, but there are only about six. Uh, pick one of those because that's pretty much your only chance of establishing the contents of the contacts that would get you a job in that field later on. And it will, of course, provide you with an excellent training. Um, if you're an undergraduate, though it matters less, what you need is a, is a good science background, but you don't need to go to a marine-specific school for that. It's your graduate degrees that are important in, in biological sciences. Thank you so much.